timely. Uh, we'll just give this a couple minutes, I'll wait for everybody to to join, and uh, then we'll get rolling. So thanks again for for joining us. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Oh, we wait to get started. If you wouldn't mind just uh, dropping in the chat, um, maybe your name and and where you're joining us from. Hope to get a sense of uh, who we're meeting with tonight. And like I said, we'll just uh, we'll just give it a little bit more, but we're getting ready to get going here. Okay, let's get started. Uh, thanks again for joining us tonight. My name is Jim Waltman. I'm the Watershed Institute's Executive Director, and we're delighted to have Clay Emerson, who's the Senior Technical Director for Engineering with Princeton Hydro tonight, on a very timely subject, uh, which is a discussion about American shad, um, their biology, their conservation, and their migration. Um, right about now is when these fish start moving up our rivers, so uh, this is an exciting time of year to talk about the shad. Uh, just a few little logistics. First, we are going to be recording this webinar. It'll be available to you. We will send a follow-up email with the link. Um, if you have a question, uh, please go ahead and post that in the Q&A feature that Zoom provides. And again, thanks for participating. This is a very exciting year for the Watershed Institute. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary. We were founded in 1949 as the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. Um, but this is a, a real exciting year for us as we think back and forward, celebrating the accomplishments of the organization over time and launching a brand new strategic plan um, that has us moving forward aggressively to combat today's big challenges. Um, the mission of the organization has remained pretty, pretty much the same for 75 years. Um, we exist to keep your water clean, safe, and healthy, protecting and restoring our local environment through conservation, advocacy, science, and education. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so if you're inspired to support the watershed tonight, thank you very much. I'll just give that thanks in advance. Uh, our home base is the Watershed Center, a beautiful LEED Platinum facility in Hopewell Township, Mercer County. Um, come on out and uh, and see us if you haven't, or even if you have. Um, lots to do and a beautiful time of year to do it. Um, tadpoles in the, in the vernal pools along the boardwalk, fish in the pond. Um, and we're also delighted to have a, a partner in Fairground Farm where we'll get started with their CSA organic farm in the next few weeks. Um, we do recognize that we're very fortunate to have this beautiful land as our home base. And we recognize that those land and waters now under our care is a traditional and ancestral territory of the Lenni Lenape. We res pay respect to Lenape peoples and we honor the work they did um, as leaders in conserving land and water. Um, we have a number of terrific talks and programs coming up. Quick 
shout out to three here. Um, Simi Payne will be discussing a proposed new biodiversity treaty um, next week. We have two terrific authors coming up in the weeks that follow. Leela Phillip, who's a New York Times bestselling author of a book, Beaverland, that's out on stands today. And Tim Palmer, also a bestselling author, has written many books on similar topics. His latest called Seek Higher Ground will probably be of particular interest to this crowd as he looks at natural solutions to the flooding crisis facing the world. Um, tonight's speaker, as I mentioned, is Clay Emerson. Clay is a water resource engineer and senior technical director at Princeton Hydro. Most of his day-to-day -day responsibilities revolve around stormwater and floodplain management, but he also works on their dam removal and fish passage and stream restoration projects that Princeton Hydro uh, has a growing uh, and strong reputation for. Clay enjoys all things outdoors and water related, including fishing and especially shad fishing. And before we got started, Clay promised to take me out shad fishing in the next few weeks if we can fit it into our calendar. So again, Clay, we're so uh, thrilled and grateful to have you join us tonight. Um, thanks again. Let me let you launch your slide deck and we'll be off and running. Great. Thanks so much for having me, um, Jim. I really appreciate the opportunity and, and welcome the opportunity to talk Shad uh, whenever and wherever. So uh, thanks a lot for that introduction. And um, so the, uh, the point of this presentation kind of is, uh, you know, generally speaking, just get to know the American Shad. Um, Probably some of you have seen them before, uh, but likely you haven't. Um, unless you've gone fishing for them, you've probably never seen one. I don't know how you would. Um, but it's a really interesting species, and I, I think you'll agree, and you probably do already. <clears throat> but we'll talk about some general background, description, similar uh, species, with some interesting history, of course, status and threats, and I'll hand it back to Jim to talk on a local level about that and the habitat restoration that's going on with um, many groups, including the Watershed Institute, of course. Um, and there's some myths and interesting facts that we'll shed some light on, and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the recreational fishery as well. So the elephant in the room, yes, of course, I've read the book, um, and you probably already know what book I'm talking about. Um, local, world-renowned author, excellent book um can't recommend it highly enough and i would add this one to the list john waldman a, a scientist uh, studies anadromous fish migratory fish um, another excellent book not just about shad but uh all the other um atlantic rivers and their uh, migratory species uh, really a really good read as well uh so here it is um this is a nice um female american shad uh, it's got beautiful color on top people ask me you know what does a shad look like and i usually just say if you ask a five-year-old to draw a picture of a fish they'll draw something that usually looks pretty close to a shad um it's just a fishy looking fish um it's got the classic forked tail which indicates that it's a pretty good fast swimmer um you know obvious scales it just looks like a fish is the easiest way i can can explain it um but to me it looks like a fish that belongs in the ocean this is not you don't see fish like this that look like this in in freshwater environments um so for good reason uh so here's another picture of another one but uh the taxonomy here again i'm an engineer not a biologist but it's the largest member of the, the herring family um obviously a ray fin fish within the herrings and some of its closest relatives would be um, uh, herring, sardines, Manhattan, or bunker. You might have heard them uh, termed. And a lot of these species do look very similar to one another. Um, what's in a name? Alosa sapidissima, uh, most delicious of herrings. Uh, that is debatable. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the further south you go, if you, um, I would say from New Jersey north, these are referred to as American shad, but if you go into Delaware, North Carolina, and South Carolina, people refer to them as white shad. Um, they are a little whiter in color than uh, the other species that uh, mixes with them. 
Um, and obviously one of their most noteworthy characteristics is this amazing migration and the fact that they spawn in our rivers, uh, but live for the most part, their entire life in the ocean. Uh, that particular migration with the spawning happening in freshwater is uh, anadromous is the word that, that we use. Um, another fancy word, sexual dimorphism. I'm told that this, uh, this means that the females, and this is the fancy way to say that females look different from the males. That is true. Um, female shad are referred to as roe, roe shad, and males are referred to as bucks for whatever reason. Females are generally larger than males. That's not a rule. Um, they obviously have an important payload that they're carrying upstream. Uh, the distinction between the two isn't always obvious, depending on where where and when you are but sometimes it is um sometimes it's very obvious if you're lucky enough to witness them spawning you can clearly differentiate uh who's who by what's going on uh so on the left here is a is a fresh um row shed that just got to the spawning grounds and you can see that abdomen just packed full of a half million eggs um, so this is a fish that probably hasn't spawned at all yet. It's fully loaded, so to speak. And on the right, we have a picture of a, uh, a male or a buck shad. Uh, don't ask me um, why I know. Um, similar species, there are a few. Um, and all these overlap with one another, can exist in the same uh, place, in, in certain places. And that's the hickory shad in the upper left that we'll talk more about. The gizzard shad on the right, a um, little, little different than these other ones in a number of ways. And then the bottom two are the one that collectively are referred to as river herring, and that's alewife and blueback herring. They're difficult to tell from one another unless you're seeing a lot of both. You can start to differentiate the two. They tend to be much smaller than the shad, uh, but not always. Um, but... You know, to the average person, these all just look like silvery fish. Um, if you get to know them a little better, you can you can start to tell them apart. So here's the who's who list. There's two shad here. They're distinct species. Up top, we have the hickory shad. Um, and below, we have, of course, the American shad. Um, maybe you can look at these photos and start to see some differences. The ones that stand out to me are the outline of the gill plate. Uh, it's a little more angular, a little more going on with the hickory shad. And the American shad kind of has a more straight, relatively non-eventful shape. And it kind of just gives it the look of a bigger cheek, if you will. Um, the American shad has a slightly more rounded um, head. And the hickory shad is a little more pointed. Their bottom lips, both, they have kind of an underbite. Uh, the hickory shad a little more so than the American shad, though. Um, uh, here's a photo of, uh, two shad that were caught at the same time. One is an American shad. One is a hickory shad. Perhaps you can tell the difference. Um, their body proportions are a little different. You can see that in the photo. Even, um, the hickory shad, not to spoil it is the one on the right. Subtle differences in coloration, but don't, don't ever rely on coloration, um, to distinguish one from or any fish from another because the color is is kind of fluid in fish they can change color pretty pretty rapidly um they do act very differently hickory shad and american shad if you're fishing in a place that has both you can tailor what you're doing to catch one or the other um and you usually know which one you have you know when when you first feel it on the line before you see it because they do act um very very differently but they do overlap um, in range, both in spawning habitat um, to a certain extent, uh, with American shad going much further upstream. And uh, they both do spawn in, in our region in New Jersey. Um, and they, they overlap in the ocean to a, to a lesser extent. American shad are typically larger, but plenty of overlap for both sexes among both species. So your biggest shad is always gonna be your American shad female, and typically your smallest will be a hickory shad buck. But again, a lot of overlap there. And and a really large American shad these days is something you know over 20 inches, to maybe 24 inches um, to give you some idea. 
Um, another interesting adaptation, both of these shad, this happens to be a hickory shad, have these, or sometimes have these false eye spots that go down their back. This one has six or seven. Um, this coloration is has evolved in, in a number of animals and plenty of fish as a way to misdirect predatory attacks uh, from, from other fish or other animals. Um, and in some experiments, the, the size and, and shape of these uh, actually changes with their exposure to different predators, which is just, I don't know, fascinating. How did that happen? And these fish are prey for a lot of things. That's one of the ecosystem services that they provide. Um, here's one that was almost prey for something. And perhaps, perhaps that false eye spot or two helped this fish get away from, um, a predator. This was probably a, a gar that got a hold of this one. And yet it got away, kept on swimming and, and, and was then caught again, um, and released. So it's, uh, they're an important piece of, of the food chain. Um, but they do a lot to try and not be part of the food chain, just, just be on top. So, uh, distribution, uh, the historic range of American shad is in the orange along the, the Atlantic coast here. Um, unfortunately due to dams, that's not the current range. Uh, all the red spots are places where they've been at one time or another stocked unsuccessfully with the exception of the West, uh, Northwest. Uh, they were stocked in the 1860s in, in San Francisco Bay and later in the Columbia River Basin. And the Columbia River hosts a, a population of American shad that actually dwarfs that of the Delaware River. Um, they're an invasive species on the West. Um, not a whole lot of problems associated with that, but 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 some um and this map is also if people ask me exactly where i fish for shad this is the map that i send them um because we're uh everyone is is tight-lipped about their 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 secret spots so if, if um if people ask me i i just send them this map um so the migration really the interesting one of the most interesting facts of 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 shad is is this amazing migration uh tens of almost tens of thousands of miles certainly in a lifetime <clears throat> in the spring right now they're they're moving up to delaware probably pretty pretty heavy in the lower river um but uh they live in the ocean um and in the summer they tend to congregate way up here in the upper right uh it's a great image from the drbc in the bay of fundy for reasons we don't fully understand um you interestingly they're not the one and done spawners that we think of most often with salmon or you know pacific coast salmon that that transform physically uh substantially physically transform you know their their body changes shape and they go and spawn and die that is not the case with american shad many of them do perish after the journey just from being exhausted um but uh many do return spawn not just once twice but you know as many as uh five six seven times i think has been documented um and that's the case for all these species the herring as well the hickory shad as well but um they do that when and where possible um and and shad from that map i showed you previously this happens up and down the East Coast from Florida um, to uh, Quebec in the St. Lawrence River. Um, oh, a quick video. You're not going to see too much here, but you'll see a bunch of small things, hopefully moving right to left in general. I'll, I'll play that one, one other time. Hopefully it's coming through okay. So these are young of the year, um, American shad that... Um, uh, are probably about four to six months old in this video, about three inches long, and they're heading slowly down river uh, towards the Delaware Bay and ultimately to rejoin the ranks in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. They'll come back up the river um, again in about three to six years. They'll spend that first three or so years in the ocean. It begs the question, why in the world make the trip, right? That seems massive energy expenditure how did this evolve how did this come to be and it really is amazing if you think about it but it turns out freshwater river systems at this latitude are a relatively safe place to young to to raise a young shad 
Um, and what's fascinating here is that if you take a saltwater fish and you put it in fresh water, or you take a freshwater fish and put it in salt water, they're going to die. They're going to die pretty quickly. Um, the chemistry to go from one to the other is, is difficult. And shad, among some other fish, not a lot, have evolved this way to, um, to regulate their body chemistry in both environments to kind of transform and then transform back again. And it involves adaptations in their kidneys and the way that they uh, intake um, uh, different ions when they're in salt water versus fresh water. Another unique ability is they do have uh, some unique hearing adaptations, um, and that's think that's thought to help them stay away from uh, dolphins and other uh, marine mammals that use uh, sound to find them. So if they can, if they know the dolphin are coming, uh, they can perhaps do some things to avoid um, getting eaten. Um, the map here talks about the migration. This is a study from the late seventies or early eighties where 10 or 12,000 shad were tagged in the Bay of Fundy. Again, that's way up here North of Maine. And this is where those tags, some of those tags were returned. So fish were caught and captured here and released. And you can see all the way up and down the coast, including here on the Delaware river tags were returned. So, um, it's amazing that they, they go up here. Uh, there's some, thoughts of, of why the Bay of Fundy, uh, but in the summer, that seems to be where they're at. Um, sorry for the gruesome picture here. This is a fish that is not going to be a repeat spawner, um, but uh, you can get some idea, some appreciation of how many eggs these shad bring with them. Um, this is a fish who's already partially spawned out, so it was fuller than this, and you can see those row sacks um, on both sides of the fish just um, full of eggs uh on the east coast you know the, the susquehanna river historically fish traveled more than 500 miles upstream the Sus up the susquehanna river unfortunately the susquehanna river is from a shad's perspective been destroyed by the the dams that are pretty low on the river there um the more north you go in the country the more likely the fish are to be able to make that return trip and come back another year for us in the delaware I've heard different estimates, and it certainly varies from year to year, but maybe about one in four uh, end up making the, the trip again. So a lot of them do die. If you're on the upper Delaware River in, say, early July or late June, you'll see a lot of dead fish. Um, and that's, of course, part of the cycle. Um, they do have this unique relatively high fidelity to get back to the river that they were born. So this shad that's um, in this photo was on the Delaware River, was more than likely born on the Delaware River five years prior. Um, and that fidelity is not complete. In other words, about maybe 5% or so stray and may end up spawning in a different river. And evolutionarily speaking, that's important because if something happens in one river, you have a portion of the population that's going to go and, and, and perhaps explore other places and, 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 uh, other habitats. So that's really an adaptation, not an error, it seems. Um, but they, uh, they do go back to their, to their home river, generally speaking. And they're, they're broadcast spawners, fractional. What that means is that entire row sack or both of them that you see in the picture, they don't lose that all in one night of spawning activity, uh, maybe over a period of weeks, um, you know, a little bit at a time. That's, you know, another adaptation uh, makes them a little bit more resilient to weather patterns and things like that. Um, maybe not all nights are successful, but some are. Um, here's an interesting photo I found from the Connecticut River Museum. Uh, you know, this photo is from more than 100 years ago. The reason I put it here is these are big fish. These are big um, repeat spawning shad here, five pounds. Um likely that or they're really small people i'm not sure which but the average size of shad has decreased over the years from the historic accounts um for for different reasons uh there must be a fish story here because these two guys have a half dozen huge row shad and the guy in the middle just has a couple american eels so it looks like they're having a laugh about about something there i'm not sure what what that backstory is but these are big fish um would be remiss if I didn't mention Native American history. There's different words in 
different uh, native languages for Shad. Uh, I found a couple references to this story um, that a porcupine had an argument with the great spirit. I guess wasn't happy about his quills. The appearance of a porcupine is, is certainly unique. And the great spirit then turned him inside out and banished the porcupine to the sea, returning only uh, to the rivers and land to spawn. And if you've ever tried to eat a shad, uh, the analogy of an inside out porcupine is, is fitting because of the numbers of bones. It is outstanding um, how many bones you cannot fillet um, an American shad like you would a striped bass or a bluefish or a flounder. Um, you will have as many bones as you do meat. There are ways to deal with that, but um, we'll talk about that later. Um, early American history, um, shad were clearly important. Uh, this gentleman, George Washington, was a commercial, uh, probably the w most well-known commercial shad fisherman. Uh, his estate at Mount Vernon overlooked the tidal Potomac River, which was historically a productive American shad fishery. It's obviously, it's not now, unfortunately. Um, and they would row uh, nets across portions of the of the the river and 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 sell shad both here and and abroad um yeah apparently this guy did some other things with american history not as important not as well known as as being uh the 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 uh a, a well-known commercial shad fisherman but apparently he has some other roles in in uh national and local history that i'm not as familiar with um john waldman in the running silver book describes shad is essentially large five pound bundles of protein and that's a real pragmatic description that uh gets to the significance of these fish to native americans first and to european settlers later because you had this mass of nutrition essentially concentrated in rivers and streams and they were very easily accessible you know put a net across build a weir um go grab them with your bare hands um i like this account from the early 1600s this is a a european settler from virginia the rivers abound with fish both small and great the sea fish come into our rivers in march uh great schools of herring come in first and shads of great bigness follow them so that's what i'm looking for when i go shad fishing shads of great bigness that is usually the target um uh more recently city of lamberville there's some shad history there the lewis shad fishery has been in operation since the eight, 1880s shad fest coming up in april has been going on since 1981 that's a chance to actually see if a shad if you've never seen one in person there'd be a should be a few making an appearance um the bigger picture here what's the overall population status the news is not good like like a lot of things, um, shad have are nowhere near their historic levels. There's some theories on that. Um, you did see a rebound in the 80s. There's some theories on that. It might have something to do with uh, at that time the absence of uh, any uh, notable striped bass population, which could be a predator is is a predator of both adult and juvenile shad. It's not really clear. A lot of things going on water quality issues, dams being constructed, more recently dams being removed. But it's a shadow of what it should be and can be. Um, so work work to be done. Uh, water quality. Um, the Delaware River has come a long way. Uh, the Clean Water Act in the early 70s, this is the classic plot here. This is from the DRBC. Um, the DO blockage essentially the river was unpassable for anything that really needed um substantial amount of or any amount of dissolved oxygen um, that's gotten a lot better certainly work to be done uh, but the delaware river does have it's generally undammed for the main stem for the majority of the length of the river amazingly um that that's the case a lot of people worked hard for that um but it does have a stable naturally sustained uh, population also with a regulated uh, commercial and, and, and recreational take fishery. Current threats um, are many. Jim's going to talk about this on a, on a local level. Um, 
But recovery is uh, restricted by access to spawning habitat, that's dams. Along the whole East Coast, 40% of their historic habitat is still blocked. Um, and that's probably accountable for at least a third of the population uh, being missing. Uh, there's also an ocean bycatch, a little more complicated, but these fish are inadvertently uh, killed at sea um, by other uh, fisheries, um, uh, multiple other fisheries. Water quality, I think we need to start considering temperature a little more. That certainly interrupts what they do and when they do it. And there's also non-native predators, so that safety of the rivers isn't quite as safe as it was for the previous uh 10 or 20,000 years of evolution for these fish. Uh, so obviously, uh, dam removal, if we're talking about habitat restoration, that has to be the first on our list. This is one on the Muscanet Kong River where shad have returned um, to new, uh, to to habitat, historic habitat. Uh, this is a one, again, on the Muscanet Kong River. We worked with the uh, Muscanet Kong River Watershed Association on this and others. Um, with other project partners, TNC. Um, and then another example, uh, even more recently, is the Columbia Lake Dam. Here it is. In 2018, um, American Shad returned upstream just weeks after the dam was removed. So in July of 2018, the excavator uh, contractor was deployed, started chipping away in the summer and into the fall of 2018. And in April of 2019, um, uh, Shad were, had already moved up uh, more than 10 miles beyond the, the work site, which was not even completed. There were still some in-stream work and things being done. So these fish are there. They're butting up against these remnant dams that the purpose of which sometimes is, is now obsolete. And if you take that dam out or if there's a high water event, they are moving upstream to the next one and they're taking advantage of that. You don't need to wait for them to show up. Um, they they will be there right away. Currently, the Paulina Lake Dam is on its way out just further upstream. This, along with another project, will ultimately restore access to 45 miles of river, including some other uh, tributaries. So the Paulins kill um things are looking up and hopefully that's going to be a um uh their a habitat that they can again again rely on um yes there are other types of, of fish passage for sure uh fish ladders these are a couple other projects uh princeton hydro projects um and there's kind of the in-between between a full dam removal and a more technical fishway which is a a nature-like fishway kind of an engineered riffle that's a little bit more like what these fish have evolved to to be able to pass uh, than than a, a aluminum uh, flume might be, but these are both um, much better than nothing, um, and um, and do do serve a purpose. Um, they do have some requirements. This is a um, they're relatively fast swimmers with that deeply forked tail. Again, this is a this is a hickory shad, but it was the only picture I had showing a good top down shot and you can see just how compressed and streamlined these things are and that dark coloration on the top while they're bright and shiny on the side if you're a predator an osprey looking down this is what you see and if you're if you're a person standing at the water's edge i challenge you to 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 point out a shad uh, very difficult to see they're not in the business of being seen um so behavior wise I'm not sure they're uh, comfortable or they have some instinctual, probably fear from, of death of above from ospreys and eagles and, and other predators. So they tend to remain on the bottom half of the water column unless they're doing their thing spawning, which happens at dusk, you know, when those aerial predators can't, can't get at them uh, into the night. Um, or if they're actively feeding, they'll come up to the surface sometimes. But generally, you're not going to see them. And that dictates what you can do to get fish past a dam, you know, via a fishway or something like that. But that body shape, they're masters of hydrodynamics. Um, that is a perfectly um, evolved, engineered, whatever you want to call it, shape for an efficient, um, for an organism to move through the water column. Um, they also, we're all used to seeing 
birds migrate in that v-shape and we all know why they do that because it you know uh, they take advantage of the vortex of the um, bird in front of them fish do the same thing <clears throat> it's not as obvious it's not that classic shape but they do the same thing and they've got a bigger thing to deal with because water is a lot heavier and more viscous than air so they take advantage of that and that schooling behavior provides a substantial energy expenditure benefit like factor of two to six times it's a lot easier for a fish to swim behind and slightly adjacent to another fish than it is for that fish to swim by itself uh so another quick video i know it'll be a little difficult to see of just you can see the schooling tendencies of these fish you know one turns the other turns they you know it's not clear who's leading the school but they do tend to stay in stay in some kind of formation um and um uh, you can also see kind of how laterally compressed kind of flat they are vertically to slice through the uh the water column um so when it comes to technical fish passage this is the fish ladder on the lehigh that frankly do doesn't really work um right at the mouth of the lehigh unfortunately so you're seeing the delaware in the in the background of this photo uh shad just don't jump like a salmon um they haven't evolved in the same place the, the rivers didn't require it frankly um uh they they physically can but it's their behavior not the physical ability that um that gets them there uh so or, or doesn't get them there so you also need to you know trick the fish into ignoring the main flow of the river and trick them to to find the the flow that's going through the, the fish ladder and so it's tricky business you, you really have to uh work on it and again shad want to school up can a shad fit through the slots in this fishway sure it can can a school of 20 fit through at one time no uh so some will use this way better than nothing that's for sure but it's it's difficult so much progress to be made on the delaware river but um including here in New Jersey that Jim will talk about. Uh, TNC put out an excellent report just a couple of years, perfect roadmap prioritization of where, uh, you know, priority dams to remove, and they're chipping away at that actively. So we'll get into um, some of the myths and interesting facts uh, that I that I think um, might be of interest to some of you. Uh, shad do not eat when they migrate upstream. You'll find that reported everywhere. It seems to be just a common knowledge or common misinformation of course they eat. um of course they do um sure not as much as they do in the more productive ocean where the where they're accustomed to that food uh that they normally eat uh but as they come up the rivers they they will eat they will eat what's available when it's available and more the more food that they're able to find um, and again, they don't really look for it. That's not what they're in our rivers to do. Their priority is spawning. But uh, if they're able to pick up some nutrition on the way or on the way down uh, back, they're obviously more likely to repeat spawn. That spawning cutoff, if they expend, you know, 60 to 70 percent of their energy, they're not going to make it back another year. But if they pick up some energy along the way, um, maybe they'll make it back. Um, so, um what do they eat at sea? Um, this kind of thing. Um, this is some uh, small copepod on the left. A small, I think it's called a mycid shrimp. There's different species of both of these. These are things that are, you could see them with your naked eye, but barely. So think like sea monkeys, if you had those as a kid. Things that are that size um, is what they eat. I wouldn't consider them really filter feeders. They don't, I don't think generally blindly filter through this i think often they they see individual things i guess if this stuff is dense enough in the ocean maybe they could just swim through it they do have gills that kind of can collect things out of the water um but uh, there was one interesting study on the york river in virginia um and they sampled 456 shad most of them had food in their stomach um they sampled them at different locations along their journey and it went from uh, fish in the ocean and bay having species like I just showed you, these small, you know, sea monkey type 
um, shrimp like organisms. And then as they got further up into fresh water, <clears throat> they had more woody and green plant matter in their stomachs, some nutrition, but not as much nutritional value, obviously. But in the Delaware River, at the right time, you can see them readily feeding on on mayfly, other emerging insects that are such an important part of our um, uh, aquatic ecosystem. Um, so it's something you'll you'll definitely see. And if you still don't believe me, here's a video of a shad seeing something that catches its attention, going up, slow motion, eating it, turning away, taking another shot at something else drifting by. Um, and, and this kind of behavior is, if you're lucky enough to be fishing in clear water, they'll do exactly this when they strike a lure. They'll go out of their way, but not much. They're not going to move more than a foot or two. You really have to put it in their face where it's, you know, they're not going to hunt it down like a typical freshwater fish would. Um, it really has to be convenient for them. Um, and so this fish sees something, adjusts slightly, takes another look at it, eats it, sees something else. Again, small adjustment, grabs it and just keeps going on its way. Um, so uh, another thing I've heard is that shad just strike fishing lures because they're annoyed by them. Um, to me, when I hear someone say that, I think, you know, being annoyed with something is a pretty complex human emotion. I'm not sure fish shad are capable of that, of being annoyed. And in one uh, hook, line, and sinker study here, um, the shad who responded to the researcher's questionnaire, only, uh, well, 79% reported feeling annoyed. 11% reported sheer boredom as the reason for striking the lure. And uh, only 7% reported actually feeling hungry. So uh, you could take that for what it's worth, which is is not much. Um, I just don't think shad are annoyed by lures. I, th I think they're they're there to 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 get a quick meal um speaking of quick meals are they good to eat another question remember the name alosa sapidissima most delicious but key point of herrings so the bar is low here folks um the and i've heard the joke you know you you smoke the shad on the for six hours on a piece of cedar and then when it's done you throw the fish away and eat the the wood plank um there is some truth to that. The, the truth really is it depends, and it depends for a good reason. These fish coming out of the ocean are loaded with calories, fat, and those things taste good to human beings, right? They're nutritious, uh, that taste delicious. So a fresh shad that's new to the river or out of the ocean or bay does taste very good. But a shad from the river, the upper river, say in May, is not something you want to eat. There's plenty of words I could use to describe it. I've tried, um, and it's it 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 is not not edible to 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 say it nicely. So, in the last ten minutes or so here, um, talk a little bit about recreational fishing. And you might say there may may be plenty of people on the webinar tonight that would say, "Why in the world would you want to frankly stab such a beautiful creature in the mouth just to pull it out of its world?" and into your own and then put it right back. I mean, that is, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's cruel. Uh, I mean, frankly, um, why do I do it? I can't explain it. Um, but I think without getting too philosophical, if you've ever stared at a campfire, I think that's like a profoundly human activity. And I group fishing in with that, even if you're just catching and releasing them and not actually getting the, the meal or the sustenance or providing for your offspring with your catch, there is something profoundly human about uh, fishing. Um, so yeah, maybe a discussion for another day, but uh, from an educational standpoint and a conservation standpoint, I'm a firm believer that people are more likely to protect something that they have experienced or at least seen, um, you know, and, and you're not going to see a shad unless you you fish for them uh, they're not in the business like i said of being seen it's also a direct way to interact with the environment and i think to fish and, and really hone your skill is is to really understand the aquatic environment you, you don't need to know just what the fish are doing but what the whole food web is doing when and why if you want to improve your your chances 
it's also a lifelong activity that you can just constantly progress or, you know, get into, um, different aspects of, um, that, that can be really re rewarding. And shad fishing is, is a very different kind of fishing. It's not anything like I was used to being a freshwater, even saltwater fishing. It's very peculiar in, in ways that can be really rewarding and also really frustrating. Um, so where, when, and how, don't ask me exactly where I'll send you the map of their population distribution, but um, they're in the Delaware River in February. Good luck catching them in February. Um, temperature, really, water temperature is the key. 50 degrees, you're good to go. Rising temperatures below 50 degrees, water temperatures will certainly work. Um, spawning happens. It's kind of like an on and off light switch right at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So they might spawn for two nights and then stop for five nights if the water temps go up and down 60, above and below 60 degrees. And uh, that changes the way you fish for them, if they're spawning or not spawning. It changes where you're fishing for them. Uh, this is a graphic. It's from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. You can probably find it online. And it tells you kind of like starting in, in, in March uh, into June, kind of the best sections of the Delaware River from, uh, you know, Trenton, essentially, um, to, um, to to New York State. A um, little bit of an introduction to fishing you can do, you can fish for shad in in very in very different ways roughly broken down into three anchored in a boat um down rigging i'm not going to talk much about that because i don't i don't do it um it uh basically they'll anchor up in a spot they'll put out many lines and and wait until a shad hits one and reel it in and it's not very hands-on so for me it's not all that appealing but if you just want to catch a shad or if you have someone who has never fished for a shad or never fished at all there are people that can take you out and they will catch fish um, they'll put those lures right where they know the shad are passing through right at the depth where they think they're passing through and it can be gangbusters but um i'll pass on it uh it's not quite as handed on as, as i like um but shorebound wade casting and fly fishing um or things I can talk in, in more detail about. Um, typically, you know, people wade. Um, you don't need to wade, but that, that's going to help you. And, you. and you cast these shad darts, they're called, across the river, and you slowly swing them with the current. And that sweet spot of the swing seems to be um, the, the, the key when that lure is presented, just like that detritus floating by in the video was, kind of with the current you know, drifting downstream like an emerging insect might be. Um, the gear doesn't have to be anything special, but if you get into it, eventually you'll end up with a fishing, a longer fishing rod, a very light action, and you can really feel every subtle pickup uh, or, or bump from a, a fish that's just, you know, quickly tapping your lure. And you really, the feel is, is the key. If you wade into the river, especially in the spring when it's cold, be careful, you can die. Um, seriously uh be, be very careful fly fishing for shad is is kind of my favorite way to do it and again casting these small flies across current staying connected you know feeling your lure feeling that pickup that subtle sometimes pickup of a shad if you if you're a fly fisherman you know that line choices there's a, a, a fly line for every situation every you know you can go crazy here um yes you can catch them on dry flies on floating line um under certain circumstances but typically you're going to be using a sinking line or intermediate line and i use a six weight from a boat with a versa leader a little weighted leader to get it down a little deeper if need be and again if you're wade fishing fly fishing be careful you can die um, you need to be be safe uh so what do we use for shad you'll hear people talk about spoons darts and flies when i first heard of shad fishing seeing these fish for the first time you know, I wonder what people were talking about. And they were not talking about this kind of thing. They're talking about spoons, a, a specific lure for shad that are mostly used by those boats down rigging that are anchored up. Uh, darts in the center of the image and smaller flies that you can tie. Um, and, and these are mostly, a lot of these are homemade. You can buy some of them, but a lot of them are, are homemade because uh, it's a very unique fishery and you don't use these lures for much anything uh, else. Uh, so to to wrap up, 
Uh, some responsible angling practices, minimize the fish's time out of water, use a plastic mesh net, not the, the, the rope kind that'll damage that protective lining on a fish, pass on the towels, um, minimize the fight time, get the fish in, barbless hooks work just as well, follow all regulations and, you know, property restrictions if you're fishing from shore, and uh, don't just clean up after yourself, you know, pick up something while you're there as well. Um. Final word, Shad do not like their pictures taken. They're not cooperative at all. So a lot of pictures end up looking like this or this or this. We try and hold them over the river so that they, when they come flying out of our hands, they land where they're going anyway, or this or this, or, or, or my favorite, this one that's, that's just squeaking out of, at the grip. So, um, so that's the quick, um, summary of, of, of shad uh, and, and shad fishing. Again, it's a great activity. And I think uh, the only thing I'll add to this and I'll hand it right back to, to Jim in a second here is that I think uh, anadromous fish and shad in particular are kind of the pinnacle of a, of a healthy, diverse and connected river system. So we've heard about indicator organisms, you know, trout being kind of like, if you have trout, you have the whole food chain going on. And I would add Shad to the top of the list as, as really having a diverse and connected and functional, um, that, that, you know, they are the connection to, uh, to the ocean ultimately. So, um, so that's what we're going for. And, and, and I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Jim right now, and he'll talk a little bit more about, um, some of those efforts. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your passion, uh, with all of us tonight uh really um really terrific talk and i'm gonna shift a little bit and talk about shad conservation and recovery in the raritan basin so let's see if i can get this slide working okay all right so um my knowledge uh with shad goes back to 2008 um, this was an example of some state and federal um, agency leaders who actually inspired some in the nonprofit sector. We like to think in the nonprofit sector, we're the ones that spark programs and projects and restoration initiatives. But um, for me, it was actually uh, a guy named um, David Bean at DEP and Carl Alderson at NOAA. They convened a stakeholders meeting, uh, like I said, back in 2008. Um, brought some nonprofits together to um, discuss opportunities to restore um, diadromous fish, diadromous being both anadromous and catadromous, so fish that are spawning both in salt and fresh and migrating the other direction the other part of the year. Um, and, the, and the goal was the Raritan Basin as a restoration area. Um, they had identified almost 40 impediments to fish passage and had some preliminary thoughts on what could be done to restore fish past those uh, past those blockages. Um, so here's a, a map on the left. You see how the Raritan Basin fits within the state of New Jersey. And on the right, a little bit closer up, um, you see three what the state of New Jersey calls wildlife management areas. So this is WMA-8, which is kind of the upper reaches of the Raritan River Basin. Um, WMA-9, which is the um, main stem downstream towards Raritan Bay, and WMA-10, which is the Millstone River. You could think of the Millstone as the south branch of the Raritan, race, uh, Raritan River if you, if you wanted to. Um, this is really fascinating. This was a, um, a, a travel log created um, in the late 1700s um, by a, an explorer named Johann David Schumpf, and it was translated from the original German uh, into English in the early 1800s. Um, but this gentleman was exploring in uh, colonial America and um, learning as he went and writing it down. And he actually wandered through the, the Millstone Valley, and he wrote here, and I'll just read this, from Bound Brook we came by way of a beautiful plain hard by the mountain where Washington's army camped in 1779. And further through an extremely well cultivated region along the Millstone River, which falls into the Raritan, but a narrow stream is not navigable. I love the way this guy writes, right? 
Um, these waters contain a multitude of fish, pike, goldfish, and suckers, formerly shad also in numberless schools, came high up this river, but dams, of which many have been built in recent years, keep back the shad. So here we are in the late 18th century, and the local residents, the colonial residents in, in our region, um, were already talking about how dam construction had blocked and eliminated the runs of migratory shad that were considered once to be in numberless amounts. So um, a really interesting little insight. Um, this is a table, I'm really not gonna go through this, but um, I think uh, Clay did mention there's certain things you need to um, be aware of when you're uh, thinking about restoring shad into rivers. Um, the different um, stages in their life cycle have different habitat requirements. Um, you can more or less boil this all down to temperature and dissolved oxygen as the most important um, uh, components of, of water quality or water chemistry. Um, suffice it to say that uh, the sense um, today is that the, the millstone and raritan system um, is perfectly adequate for uh, restoring these beautiful fish if we can get the, the dams out of the way, the blockage is removed. So here's a, here's a map that shows um, the dams, or at least some of them that we were looking at and we're prioritizing back in 2008. You see a whole bunch of dams in this, uh, in this region. And the really good news is that some of these have been removed. So in 2011, Calco Dam was removed. Uh, the Robert Street Dam came down in 2012. Uh, and then the Nevia Street Dam was removed in 2013. These all came out of the Raritan River, um, both upstream and downstream with its confluence with the Millstone. Um, the funding was made available through a terrific uh, uh, settlement of a natural resource damage um, case. Um, that's a really um, important source of funding for habitat restoration projects like dam removals. Um, if, you, if you don't know about that program, we can talk about it a little bit later, but it's a, a great source of funds. And then in 2017, the Weston Mill Dam came out uh, of the Millstone River. Um, this is a woman named Peggy Savage sitting on what was the Weston Mill Dam. Um, and I include this photo just as a demonstration of how long it can take to get these bloody things out of the river. So um, Peggy was the predecessor of our current science director's predecessor. And so it took uh, uh, just about 10 years to get this structure out, which to us had no purpose, no reason. We thought this would come out um, in a real quick period of time, but that one, even without much controversy, it took more than 10 years. So this is this is uh, not for the faint of heart, this work of removing dams. It requires a lot of stubbornness, perseverance, persistence. Let's see. So what happened? What was amazing is that um, the spring after that dam was removed, um, we were already seeing adult American shad swimming up the Millstone River. This is Steve Tordo. He's our current science director. Um, and this was Steve out on a um, fish monitoring day with uh, our friends at NJDEP and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And boy, was that exciting. So a dam that was probably, there was thought to be a dam in the Millstone River near Weston Mills since the early 1700s. Um, may have been not the same dam. The original dam was probably replaced is what historians say, but imagine a river that's been blocked to fish migration for almost 300 years. You take the dam out and bang, American shad show up. Um, the very next spring. And even more exciting, um, that fall, in the fall of 2008, was the first recorded young of the year shad in the Millstone River in recorded history. This is the uh, press release from DEP, um, which was very exciting to have the, the agency fully on board on this project and, and bringing back these fish. Um, 
they they looked uh, they quoted 173 years. That was thought to be the age of that specific dam that was removed. But at any rate, the first time that uh, scientists had uh, seen young of the year, the baby shad in the Millstone River ever. Okay, so uh, we've got some more work to do. This is the Blackwell's Mills Dam. Um, this is really the last remaining full blockage of shad uh, between the Raritan Bay and the town of Princeton. And so this is the, the dam that we currently have our sights on. Um, we actually worked with Princeton Hydro um, in the late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, and Princeton Hydro uh, commissioned from the Watershed Institute did all of the necessary studies we thought <laughs> to get this dam removed. So there were feasibility studies. They looked at the sediment behind the dam. They looked to see if there was any contaminated sediment there. They did a full hydrologic and hydraulic study. Um, there's a lot of steps you need to go through before removing a dam. All of that was completed, um, but sadly the dam is still in the river and I'm gonna explain what that is. Um, I will say just last spring, um, we went out again with another, uh, uh, monitoring day with the DEP and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, and found more adult American shad. So COVID kind of got in the way of a, the, you know, a continuous monitoring program, um, but we were delighted to see the, the shad um, really within about 50 feet of this uh, dam right here. So these fish were trying to work their way up the Millstone River um, did not see any upstream of the dam as we didn't uh, expect to. But the fact that the fish are still running um, now a uh, full, uh, I guess, six years after the dam was removed is really exciting. Okay, so what can possibly be delaying the removal of the Blackwell's Will Mills? So I'm going to try not to get too far into the weeds here. But the map on the right shows a system of gauging flow gauging weirs or, or I'm sorry flow gauges that are operated by the US US Geological Survey in the in the Millstone and Raritan Rivers and this is really important work so they are gauging the flows and keeping track of the data of uh, the flow levels in the Millstone and the Raritan River as they do in rivers across the United States um, where we part ways with the USGS is um, this one in yellow. So the gauge that is at Blackwell's Mills is located within the impounded pool of the Blackwell's Will Mills Dam. So the dam's in the river, it impounds water, there's a gauge in that pool. And USGS believes that that dam makes for more precise and accurate information on the flow of water in the river than if the dam were to be removed. So NJDEP owns the dam, USGS has a, a flow gauge behind the dam, and they've been arguing for years now about removing it or not removing it. Now, what's um, interesting to us is that there are plenty of situations that are very similar. Um, the Jordan Creek in Pennsylvania is one of several um, in that state where there was a dam, there was a USGS flow gauge behind the dam. The dam was removed. The gauge was recalibrated. And the data collection is considered by the agency to be as accurate and as precise as it was before when the dam was there. So what you see here is just the, the data. This is the ratings curve. So you see basically the relationship between the height of the river and the amount of flow in the river, the volume of flow in the river. The red shows their ratings curve back when there was a dam. The blue shows that uh, ratings curve after the dam is removed. And so today the, the ability to judge the flow of the river based on the height of the river is just as strong as it was back when there was a dam. So very similar situation we believe um, USGS was a partner with the nonprofits who removed the dam from the Jordan Creek um, 
but we've got a little different uh, conversation going here in New Jersey. Um, this is a, a analysis of data. You see a, more than 40 years of data collected. Again, it's the same um, two axes. You're looking at the gauge height. So it's the height of the river, the level of the river versus the flow in the river. Um, Calco Dam, remember, was removed in 2011. So that very clean uh, line, if you will, it's not a straight line, but it's a very predictable line, um, was really not uh, uh, thrown off track by the removal of the Calco Dam back in 2011. Um, we've been uh, fortunate to have a recent uh, college graduate, Michael Kim, who's working with us over the last year is our um, fish restoration fellow. And Michael spent a lot of time, <laughs> uh, more time than I would have patience for probably, at looking at the data that's been collected by USGS at the various gauges on the Millstone River. Um, what you see here is the height, the, the height of the river at the Blackwell's Mills station and the Griggstown station. Griggstown is the next flow gauge on the Millstone upstream from Blackwell's Mills. And you see a very tight relationship of the data between the two. Um, now, Blackwell's Mills uh, is collecting data on both the height and the flow. Breaks down only the stage height, only the height of the river, not the amount of flow in the river. Um, but this is really an interesting analysis that Michael did as well. This compares the height of the river at Griggstown and the flow or the discharge of water in the river at Blackwell's Mills. And you see a very tight relation, relationship there as well. So our conclusion is that um, removing the Blackwell's Mills Dam really won't throw off the, the data collection. It will not undermine the accuracy or precision um, of the important data that's collected at Blackwell's Mills. So we're eager to just um, have this dam removed and allow the fish to recover. Now there's some other issues still in the in the Millstone Raritan system. Um, this is a structure called the Island Farm Weir. This was actually built to impound water uh, very close to a New Jersey American um, water company's uh, drinking water plant. So out of concern that the level in the rivers may get too low for the plant to be operational, they put this weir in um, several decades ago. Um, so it impounds, it holds enough water to be sure that there's always uh, adequate supply for the drinking water plant. Um, what they did at the Island Farm Weir was also install one of those fish ladders that Clay was talking about. So you see where that yellow arrow is, there's a little side alleyway that fish can go through. Now, unfortunately, just as uh, as Clay was, was uh, indicating before, um, it's not all that effective to allow shad and other fish to pass. Um, and so, for uh, for example, there was an analysis done by Olaf Johnson. He was a former faculty member at Rutgers and his graduate students um, that suggested that only about 10% or maybe even less than that of the shad who attempted to go through the fish ladder actually made it through. So they were able to put little radio tags on the fish, track them through this fish ladder, um, and most of the fish didn't make it through to the other side. Um, and in fact, those that did ended up, uh, at, at least half of them, pretty well beaten up um, because they're going through a concrete structure, basically a series of rooms that the fish have to move from one room to the next. And by the time they get through, quite a few of them are pretty pretty beaten up. Um, now, Clay, you, you made one very important omission to your presentation about shad. Um, you left out what I always consider one of the best shad jokes. I'll let you all decide Shame. for yourself. The reason that shad have so much trouble getting over structures and through these fish ladders is because white fish can't jump. All right. Not Fair a enough. good joke, but I've heard Fair it too enough. many times to not repeat tonight. Okay, so what are we doing around the island weir? Well, um, the Watershed Institute is mostly cheerleading 
an effort by the DEP, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA to construct what's called a rock ramp. So this is what it sounds like, um, a ramp built behind that island farm weir on the upstream side that would allow the fish to swim up and over that dam um, without needing the, the fish ladder. It's, it's a, if it's a different kind of structure um, that's been successful in some instances anyway, in allowing uh, shad and other uh, fish to migrate past structures like the island farm where. So um, that too um, has funds earmarked from uh, NRD, a natural resource damage settlement. Um, they've been doing a lot of analysis and hopefully that'll be um, completed in the, in the next few years. Um, here's another dam, Headgates. This is further up the Raritan River. Um, this one also um, is to be removed with funds from the uh, natural resource damage settlement I just mentioned. So you can see there's been a lot of progress and a lot of movement in um, taking down these obsolete dams and allowing these wonderful fish, the shad and river herring and other fish to migrate up the, the Raritan and Millstone system. Now, I want to say something before I get myself in trouble. Um, this is the dam at Lake Carnegie in Princeton. Uh, this is where we're trying to get the shad to. Um, it's not in our plans to advocate to remove this dam. This dam was built in 1906 uh, by the university uh, to create a, a lake, which has a lot of recreational use, including the Princeton University crew teams. Um, but this, we think, is a candidate for a rock ramp or a fish ladder or some other kind of uh, technical fish passage. And so we've started uh, a conversation about that. So the, the dream is to get the fish all the way up to the structure and then engineer a way around the structure uh, without removing it. Okay, that's just another note on uh, upcoming programs. Um, I wanna thank you again for all uh, joining us tonight and thank Clay. I'm gonna um, stop my share. Clay, we did actually have a couple of questions. Um, I answered a few of those, but uh, maybe you can take a crack at, at a couple of these. Sure. Yeah, another one that uh, that I did answer um, was a good one about, you know, uh, even when, uh, you know, in prehist prehistory times or pre-settlement times anyway, that there were likely beaver dams. And, and I know another mm -hmm. one of your speakers that are coming up is going to talk about that and and the question was, didn't that block uh, shad? And I would say in some cir circumstances, it probably did. But I would guess that the beaver dams were not in, say, the main stem of the Delaware. Uh, they probably tended to be on tributaries. So there probably was some blockage. But also, one thing that I, I didn't have time to go into was um, Im impediments in a river um, uh, that, that block fish migration um there are some that block migration all the time like the one that you just showed and there are some that probably are passable during a flood for example if the water is really high and so i would think that a lot of the smaller beaver dams anyway probably would have fallen into that latter category that fish could have pushed over them during periods of high flow uh when the they weren't as big of a hydraulic impediment and yeah i mean they any of the number of these shad could physically jump over a beaver dam but they just they just won't do it um so um so i don't think that was a problem for them um at the time but the dams we have now cer certainly are um Thank i think you. the other question was just about a, a specific dam on the passaic river and i would agree that the passaic river um like the raritan had a I'm sure had a historic shad population and there's, there's work to be done there uh, as well. Um, all the, all the major rivers in New Jersey had with the exception of the rivers that come from the pine barrens, because I think the pH is too low for them to be able to successfully spawn. But other than, other than, and you know, but other than that, I think uh, from the Cohansey on up, um, 
all the way to New York, all those tributaries, um, as well as the Atlantic coast drainage besides the Pinelands, um, certainly had historic runs that hopefully we'll see again one of these days. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so thank you. I, I don't know the lake that's been um, asked about here by uh, Jake Diddy's. Um, maybe you, you could uh, follow up with an email to us and we can we can take a look at that. Um, and I would just uh, in, invite, in fact, encourage all of you, if this is a, a topic of interest, um, we need more advocates for removing dams and, and restoring fish in the state. Uh, there's many um, benefits to doing so. It's it's certainly the restoration of these fish. Um, it also improves water quality. Um, when you remove structures, um, can open up the rivers to their floodplains, which can provide more uh, natural flood attenuation. So I think this is a really important movement. Um, I'm excited personally about the progress that's been made in the state of New Jersey. Um, there's a lot more to do. So please um, get in contact if if you want to find out how you can get involved um, and and work with us to encourage DEP to remove the Blackwell's Mills and keep at it on some of these other structures. Um, here's a question: Do black bear feed on shad? Clay, do you have an answer to that? I imagine they do. I, I sure do. It may not be the one that he was uh, getting at, but um, yes, uh, they do. Not like you would see, you know. Uh, chasing down salmon in inches of water. But I can assure you that if you uh, bake a shad on a campfire for a period of 10 hours, smoking it to melt those bones and, and so that you don't have to deal with the bones and fill it with butter, I can assure you from personal experience that you will have a black bear visiting your campsite uh, <laughs> as at, at dusk. And it's not a situation you want to find yourself in. So um yes they they i'm sure they do although the, the dying ones they probably would turn a nose up at those uh because the, the again the flavor just isn't there but certainly when you if you think about the transport of nutrients and biomass up and up and down our rivers um with the extirpation of these fish by with dam construction um it's really modified these riverine systems so um as the fish are allowed to come back um, that brings a lot more nutrients up into the system, food for all kinds of critters, um, whether they're black bear or there to eat them or not, um, to restore uh, different elements um, and levels of the food chain. That's These right. Perfect systems is is uh, absolutely essential. Yeah, ocean ocean born uh, nutrients that are um, otherwise the only the only source for some of these these streams and the and the food web. So yeah, there's a whole. Um, so that's another component of it that that gets overlooked, but absolutely. Well, terrific. Thanks again. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, you'll all receive an email, I believe, tomorrow with a link. Um, if you'd like to watch the video or share it with others, um, we hope you'll do so. And again, I hope you'll, you'll be in touch uh, to join us in this important initiative. Yeah. Thanks so much for attending, everyone. Good night.